right. Thank you very much. Stop, stop. Oh, you have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Stephen Fry. <laughs> um, we are going to invent an alphabet, and I'm going to make some of it up, and Stephen's going to make some of it up, and we're going to need you to help us with some of the letters. But we're going to start with... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start with ambition, Stephen. What is it that you would most now like to do? Now, it's very hard to answer. Um, I, uh, I, I have a theory that is very unpopular in America, that, um, that the worst thing you can ever be is goal-oriented. Um, in, in America, it is taken as a sacred truth that the first step towards self-fulfillment and success is to set yourself goals. Um, and, and I think that that is the most disastrous thing in life you can ever do, partly because if you miss your goals, you hate yourself and you feel a failure. And if you hit your goals, you are bound to be astonished by the fact that they don't bring any level of happiness. So you, you, it is, it's just looking in the wrong direction. So I don't, I'm not sure what I'm ambitious to be. If I said I was ambitious to be happy, that would sound very dull. Um, I, you know, as, as no one I am ambitious to go to bed with. There's no one I'm ambitious to uh, meet, necessarily. I, I'm, I'm, I, I suppose it's just... What I'm ambitious for is not to turn into a, a bitter, angry old person. I'm now 52, and if there's anything in the world that upsets me, it is... Um, it's that kind of... I hate this, I hate that. that you know, when you see newspapers saying why this is terrible or people saying that something is crap or, uh, and, um, and those programs like Grumpy Old Men, you know? I can't, I just, it's, apart from, it's just so easy. It's a lot of, I mean, people I like, Arthur Smith and Will Self are bright and clever people just pretending to be angry about things that, and, and I would hope that as I got older I got more and more accepting of everything, so that if, say, in 30 years' time there's a modern equivalent of Lady Gaga, I want to think that I will say, tunes are so much better now than they ever were. All things are better than they ever were. They may not be, but they're almost certainly not worse. But something happens to you as you age that makes you convinced that they're worse. And I hate that something. I think it's deleterious to the human spirit to believe that your island of youth was somehow privileged and blessed as better, richer, more, you know, more fulfilling, more artistic, more creative, more innocent. All of that is really a result of uh, sentimentality of the wrong kind, false memory syndrome, and, and a lack of historicity. Because if you look in history, people have always said that. They've always said it. And, and I think the best ambition anyone can ever have is to get younger as they get older, to be more accepting and to be less closed. That's what I would hope for. B is for ball. Oh, thank you very much. B is for... B is for bored. What makes you bored? Oh, bored. I mean, you work at a higher speed than almost anybody I know. So what, what holds you up? Um, bored. I'm, I suppose it, it's very interesting being in the public eye. Um, it relates to ambition. If you'd said, what, what, what was I ambitious for when I was a teenager? I've recently had to accept that when I was between 17 and 25, if I'm honest, I was desperate to be famous. I really was. And I know now that we are all supposed to pay lip service to the idea that fame is an illusion, a snare, a terrible rainbow that people chase that will only get further away. It's not the substance of what it is you should be doing, that the, the modern culture of celebrity is a, is a terrible thing. But nonetheless, when I was a teenager watching Parkinson, 
I, I wanted to jump into the television and be part of this glamorous world of extraordinary people. I, I fantasized about being stopped in shops and asked for an autograph. But what I did not fantasize about was a world that, and oh, how, how just it is that I should suffer from it, a world that I've welcomed, the digital world, has m now means that unlike when I first did become quite well known, everybody now has a camera. And if you want to know what bores me, <laughs> it is at a signing queue for a book, for example. Um, it used to be fun to be able to go, and what's your name, where are you from, without sounding like the Prince of Wales, which is a challenge. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, but to fall into a, a conversation is really good fun. But now that's impossible, because the moment someone arrives at the queue, they're looking at the person next to me and going, would it be all right if I had a photograph? And it's not only that they have a camera, whether it's in the form of a phone or a digital camera, it's, of course, they want to be in the picture. So they're giving it to someone else. And that person is like someone who has never seen a reptile being given a chameleon. <laughs> What, so, ugh, how do I, huh? It's just, oh, oh, I've turned it off, I think. It's, it's, if I could have back the hours in which I have gone, oh, get on with it, for f***ing sake, get on with it. If, if I had that back, I would be very happy. So that is when I am maximally bored, if maximally can be considered an adverb. Uh, Cambridge, what kind of... What kind of transfer was that for you? It, it was a very extraordinary thing for me. And um, what I'm about to say will sound about as poncy as you could ever be. Um, but it, being this, as this is a literary festival, maybe it's allowable. When I was 17, I got arrested by the police, um, which I wrote about in my first autobiography. And, and I went to prison. And when I emerged, I emerged from a custodial sentence, as, as it were, a custodial period, with two years probation, um, and my parents were understandably at the end of their tether, and they, they were, they'd been amazing, uh, considering I'd run away from this and I'd been expelled from schools. And, um, and so when I arrived back home on, on, on probation, I said, I want to do some A-levels. I'd run away from so many schools. and I'd done my O-levels when I was 14, because in those days you did. Um, if, you know, if you well, were no, considered. most people didn't at 16. So yeah, but I mean, just a lot no, I mean, if you could. People, I mean. Yeah, all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, and so, but then I seriously kind of screwed up every other opportunity. So um, they said, well, if, it's fine if you really want to, but it's up to you. They, you know, they said, we're, we're no longer going to do it. So I knew that Norwich City College, which is like a further education in, establishment in Norwich, did a one-year A-level course. So I... I I went, literally, the day I got back from Puckle Church, which is the name of the prison I'd been in, it sounds like a beautiful bed and breakfast somewhere <laughs> in, in the Lake District. Welcome to Puckle Church. But it was, in fact, it was such a hard place, it got shut down. It had riots. I used to get called up by the newspapers to comment on it, like an old boy you know, talking about his school. <laughs> so, oh, it never happened in my day. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, so... There was this queue, and it was the second day of registration for this college, and I was really at the end of the queue on the second day, and I got there, and there was this little man, and his name was Peter Butler, never forget him, he had silver hair and bright blue eyes, and um, he said, what, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do A-levels, um, I want to do English, French, and History of Art. He said, oh, I think there may be a one place left on French, but the other two have gone, you'll have to pick something else. I said, no, no, those are the ones I want to do. And he said, well, I've just told you, they're oversubscribed. So I looked at him and I said, if you let me do these, I will get A grades and I will also get a scholarship to Cambridge. You, you must let me do this. And he looked at me and there was this pause that seemed like an eternity. And he went, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this. All right, okay, you're signed in. <laughs> and and that, that was the moment I now realized, looking back, on, on which my entire life pivoted. It was the hinge of everything, and um, fortunately, I, 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 I was as good as my word. But the reason I picked Cambridge, this is the Ponzi pit, was that I had fallen in love with 
G.E. Moore and E.M. Forster and Goldsworthy Lowe's Dickinson and Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein and the, what were then considered the progenitors and the big influences behind the Bloomsbury movement, and particularly with their cult of personal relations. Forster later in, in one of his essays got into some trouble for saying if it came to, a, and this was in reference to some of his friends, the Apostles, which was a group of Cambridge intellectuals, um, some of whom were people like um, Guy Burgess, uh, who of course was one of the Cambridge spies, the, the, the traitors. If you, uh, um, Forster said, if it came to a choice between, between betraying my friend or betraying my country, I hope to God I would have the guts to betray my country. And it's that, the primacy, the high doctrine of friendship and personal relations and an absolute instinctive distrust of causes and the abstract that I thought was part of a Cambridge that went all the way back to Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley and, the, and not that I was religious but the, those who were martyred famously in Oxford. Cambridge produces martyrs and Oxford burns them. And um, <laughs> there is a martyr's memorial in Oxford to prove it. All the ones burnt there were Cambridge people. And, and, and it, 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 there was something about Cambridge that appealed to me. It was the, it was the mixture of rigour. I think after all the terrible things I'd done, um, the thieving and, the, you know, the, and the, the, the explosive disappointments of romantic love and, and physical love and all the other forms of love, agape and eros, um, uh, um, I just thought that I needed the discipline and the restless intellectuality and the... Um, the, 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 the refusal to accept the world that Cambridge represented. Oxford represents the world and always has. It's really extraordinary how going all the way back throughout the history that Oxford was a royalist stronghold and Cambridge was a Puritan stronghold. And there's nothing attractive about it. I'm, I'm not saying for a minute that Cambridge is more attractive. Uh, in many ways, it's less attractive. That Cromwell was a Cambridge man, you know, and, and Oxford was the capital of King Charles's Stuart cavalier, uh, you know, it was his citadel. Um, and then, as I say, also previously before that, the, the Cranmers and, the, and, and, and others. And all the way up, Robert Hewison wrote a very good book called Monty Python, The Case Against. Um, he wasn't presenting the case against it. He was merely recording the opposition to Python. But, and he writes a very good chapter about the, the tradition in Cambridge of long, lean, sarcastic Cambridge people, as opposed to short, dark, rather more friendly Oxford people. And you can see it in Beyond the Fringe, there's Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller, as opposed to Dudley Moore and Alan Bennett, who are lovely. How could you not love Alan Bennett? And how could you not love Cuddly Dudley? And how would you not be scared by Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller? And then in the Python era, the same thing. You've got the lovely Michael Palin and the lovely Terry Jones, and you've got the incredibly sarcastic Eric Idle, Graham Chapman, and John Cleese. And he says, you know, the average Python meeting would be Terry Jones and Michael Palin saying, let's have some pantomime Princess Margarets. And John Cleese would go, why? <laughs> and <laughs> that, that tension, as it were, and, and actually you can even go further forward. You could say, well, Richard Curtis and Rowan Atkinson are a lot more lovable than that awful Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry, for example. <laughs> uh, dance. Darts. Oh, now you've got me going. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I, 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 a couple of Mondays ago, I, an ambition of mine was fulfilled. I, I sat next to Sid Waddell, who is the voice of darts, the, the, that Geordie commentator. Um, Tell us, the, Stephen, the, what he sounds like. Well, he said, he said, total eclipse of the darts, he said at one point, <laughs> which, which was very exciting. And I was able to come back with Bonnie Taylor because um, um, Phil Taylor is the, probably the greatest sportsman alive on the planet. You may question the use of the word sportsman next to a dance player, but um, he is 15 times world champion. He's broken every possible record. I don't think that any other sport in the world has a, has a, has a 15 times world champion. I find dance an absolutely captivating spectacle. And I think one of the things that's most captivating about it is this unspoken, or indeed sometimes quite boldly spoken fact that people think there is a massive disconnect between someone like me enjoying uh, the gladiatorial arena of this extraordinary game, which is performed by rather tattooed working class people. And they therefore think either I'm being like some of those 
Regency bucks who used to beat up the watch and go, rah, rah, you know, how funny, let's watch some working class people beating each other to death. Um, or, or, or that I'm patronising, or that I'm trying to be cool. Or, but it is, it's nothing to do with that. There is this unwritten British embarrassment about the fact that darts is an, it's a pub game and it's a working class game and it is a very male game, it has to be said. But, and it's obviously not attractive to see large, overweight, sweaty men with tattoos, except for the fact that they are so good at their sport and the scoring of darts is so exciting that you get fantastic games. And I was able, as I said at the time I, uh, on live television, so I had to be careful, I'm like a pig in Chardonnay. And um, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, <laughs> that's how I felt. Uh, I know it's odd, but there you are. Um, Martin Amis, uh, after all, uh, do you remember um, uh, uh, London Fields, uh, one of his very best novels, if not his best, I think. It's a really a marvellous book. He writes about darts really well. <laughs> Eros. Ian? Eros. Oh, Eros. Yeah. Oh, saw backwards by no, no accident. Um, um, no, hang on. Um, <laughs> um, it's also an anagram of Rose. Um, too late. <laughs> too late, you're right. Um, yes. Um, when, when you're a child and you, you watch films on television, you, you, you tend to wonder why it is that the, the action, the comedy, the adventure stops every now and again for this bewildering, baffling nonsense that is eros, that is love. Um, and then when you pass through childhood into adulthood, there's a part of you that sometimes questions why there is any other subject in the world. It is all there is to think about and talk about love. It is, of course, uh, everything within us. And it, the extraordinary thing about, and of course there are many shapes to it, the Greeks, uh, I, I, I alluded to a couple of them, agape and eros, but there's philos, and there, there are many others, Greek words for it. There, there are many nuances of, 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 of love. Um, and we know how important it is to us, and so much so that we don't even think about it, um, because um, because we, we sort of almost couldn't couldn't carry on living because of how important it is. And our dreams often tell us this. Uh, it's it's fascinating how how often one dreams about a moment of love or someone one has loved or, or lost or or unrequitedly loved um, will come back 30 years later, and you think, oh my God, I'm not still, am I? I am. And I remember seeing a, a, a man of 106 being interviewed uh, on television on his 106th birthday. He was in, in Norfolk and he was the oldest man in East Anglia, which we were very proud of. And, uh, and the interviewer said, um, is there anything um, that makes you unhappy about being old? Is it, you know, do you, all your friends? He said, well, it's not my friends, but he said, I, I still miss my mother. And I thought, wow, of course, of course you would. My mother, I'm happy to say, is still alive, but, but I'm sure I'd miss her, and I'd miss my father if he went. And there's no reason why one shouldn't. If you love someone, you love them forever. It doesn't, you know, just because the, the string is cut by Atropos, or whoever, whichever, that, whichever it was of the ones who, who cut the string of one's life, um, it doesn't mean that your emotional concern is cut. And, you know, love is... Uh, is just, um, it's overwhelming. And, and I remember when I was um, first uh, involved in things like Stonewall or, or gay rights or whatever, and I was asked to speak at a parliamentary thing for Edwina Curry, of all people, who, um, for all that one may um, much mock her, she, she was the one who, uh, who put in a private member's bill for an equality of an age of consent. Uh, for, for gay or straight or any other kind of uh, uh, age of consent she just felt should be the same. Um, and so I was rather with her on this and didn't, almost didn't matter what the age was as long as it was equal, it seemed to me. <clears throat> but I remember addressing in Westminster Hall a group of, um, of people and uh, I said this thing that I trot out from time to time about when do you know you're gay and um, that I remember when I was born looking up and saying, well, that's the last time I'm going up one of those. And, uh, <laughs> The, the, um, That's the, such a bad guy. It's Steve. terrible, That's isn't it? Such... <coughs> I'm ashamed. <coughs> but the, but the, the point it was. <laughs> it's also verbally wrong, yeah. of course, because you didn't go up it. No, yeah, 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 <laughs> part of me did. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 
But the real thing that I said, and I'm convinced is true, there were, there were a lot of MPs saying, you know, what gay people do, um, uh, is that what's shocking about love is never the physical part of it, it's the emotional part of it. Um, it's, it's not, people may do all kinds of things with their bodies, which may or may not disgust or alarm one, um, but it's the, uh, it's how much of themselves they subsume in another person is something quite extraordinary. Um, and it's, it's so, I mean, it's the subject of most films and most songs, and, and yet it's so extraordinary that we, we never stop to contemplate how, how bizarre it is that, that that's what we give ourselves to. And that is the secret of almost every human being you meet. If you meet someone who is an utter turd, and in life you will, you only, don't do that thing they tell you is, oh, imagine them all naked, and then you'll have contempt for them. That's not the point. Imagine the absolute truth of even the most aggressive, unpleasant, self-regarding, vain, unsympathetic person you could ever meet and remember that they are not only desperate to be loved, but they are desperate to love. And I, I, I've never met a human being of whom that isn't true. And it's so astonishing that we don't even bother to think about it because it's almost too much for our brains to take in, I think. Anyway, sorry, there we are. Um, <laughs> Folk music. Folk music, yeah. Oh, you remember, I did a, the Britannia Awards, uh, Folk, uh, Brit Folk Britannia or whatever, awards for the... Um, I'm very fond of folk music, and, and I think, um, as always, like Martin Amis, who's been on this stage many times, are you getting a little obsessed? R well, with, with Martin Amis? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, I was. I was uh, he's a great writer. Well, well yes. Um, <laughs> but, but resistance to the cliché is an important thing. And, and when I was starting out in comedy, it always annoyed me when I saw comedians doing things that other comedians did. But not only that other comedians did, that anybody in a bar could do. So that if you said folk music, they'd just go, like that. You go, that's like... That is the cheapest, it's like the equivalent of pornography in comedy. It's just like just touching a sort of comic G-spot that is unworthy. That really, the, co the comedian I'd respect is the one who came on and said, isn't folk music great? And make it funny that it was great. Because the idea that all it is is Morris dancers. Folk music is the music of a, a roots music. You have to change the name to make people like it. But some of the most talented musicians, Kate Roosby, people like that, in Britain are folk musicians, and, and the music is deep and it's complex and it's exciting and it's unusual. I, I won't say that it's automatically better than any other kind of music, but that it is most certainly worth listening to. Yeah. Um, genome. Where would one scroll you back to on your way to the Congo 2,000 years ago? 20, 100,000 years ago? Oh, me? Gosh. Well, I, I mean, um, John Lennon, is, we're all peasants, as far as I can tell, I think was John, John Lennon's line. Um, I, I'm lucky enough <coughs> to have done, <coughs> which I'm sure many people would love to, that BBC programme, Who Do You Think You Are?, where you can at least go back to some extent in your roots. But, but again, the, the, the devilish part of me, although I'm, I'm very interested in the Fry family and I was very interested in my mother's family, um, you know that old story about the uh, invention of chess and how the emperor who had commissioned uh, the, 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 the best minds in the empire to come up with a game that was both fair, didn't give an advantage by luck, but also was complex. And, and this game inventor came up with chess and the emperor said, this is so brilliant, I'm gonna give you every, any reward you want. And the inventor said, well, you see this board, it's eight squares by eight squares. Um, if you could put a grain of rice on, on the first square, and put two on the next square, and then four, and then eight, I'll, I'll take all the rice and, and that you fill the chessboard with. And the emperor thought, well, I got away with that easily, didn't I? And of course, he hadn't got halfway before it became apparent that this was more rice than there was in the world. And that is the power of exponential curves, of, of, of the uh, you know, arithmetical pr progression of numbers. And it's the same with us and parents. We have two parents and four grand grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, no, 512, 2000, yeah, 1024, Stop. et cetera. Yeah, you, it, it, it soon becomes a gigantic number in a very short time, <clears throat> such that 
it is obvious we have, if you have any English blood in you at all, for example, choose England, um, then you must be directly descended from William II, if not from Henry III, and a later one, because you have more ancestors going back then than the population of the country. So you must. There's no possibility that you aren't, even allowing for quite a lot of incest. Um, <laughs> and yet you meet someone, someone who's called Bridgeworth, and they'll say, oh, yes, there have been Bridgeworths in this part of Sussex for 200 years. And you say, well, you know, you, 200 years, you have thousands of ancestors. And, and each one of them is as responsible for your existence as any other. The fact that we happen to live in a society that chooses the patronym, this one, the one male that holds the surname, doesn't mean you're more related to them. If any one of those thousands didn't exist, you wouldn't exist. Now, this becomes important in a sort of xeno-philosophical way, in an ethical way. And in fact, going back to Cambridge, and Ian Forster wrote a wonderful essay called On Jew Consciousness in the, in the very early 30s, around the time of the ascension of Hitler and Nazism and, and, the, and the rather accepted uh, face of anti-Semitism. He said, I'm not here in this essay, he said, I'm not going to argue about whether or not anti-Semitism is moral or immoral, I have my views on that, but let's just look at one side of it, uh, about whether or not it's Jews are a stain and a bad thing. He said, let's take the best known family in the world. He said, I would submit that is the House of Windsor. So let's look at the Prince of Wales, as he, as he then was, the great Prince of Wales, you know, David, you know, became Edward VIII. Um, I do not believe that even the Prince of Wales could name his eight great-grandparents, let alone his 16 great-great-grandparents. And if he can't, from the most famous family in the world, then how can any, any of us name our eight great-grandparents? And if one of them is Jewish, or even a part Jewish, we wouldn't exist but for Jews. It is up to those who say, let's cleanse the race of Jews, first to prove that they aren't Jewish and they won't be able to. The fact is we are so miscegenated. And, and, and that's really the point about, about genomes is, you know, it, it, the ide what do we base our identity on? Uh, it, it's really interesting. And when I was in Kenya um, filming in November last uh, year, um, it was the American election, and it happened to be the time that uh, obviously Obama won it. And uh, I was filming, and the, the, there was a, some people from the same tribe that Obama's father came from, and they uh, said, um, I said to them, oh, God, you must be very excited that America's got a black president, and he's Kenyan. He said, yes, but remember, if he had been the same man who stayed in Kenya and become president of Kenya, he would have been our first white president. And it's absolutely the point. As far as they're concerned, he's half white, he's half black. Why call him black? What, what sense does that make? And, and to me, that's the most exciting thing about uh, philosophy or anything else, is that, the con that, that sort of being general, being, not being general, but being concrete about things. What do we really mean by black or white? You know, actually being honest enough to go and, and question our own things. So I don't know what my genome except to say that it's probably very similar to yours. And we're certainly related, we're all related in this room. And if that sounds like a hippieish way of saying we're all brothers and sisters, well, well, why not? Hitler. Ah, yes. You wrote a novel <coughs> yeah. um, called Making History. Yeah. which is one of the very few works of fiction, actually works of art at all, that satirises Hitler. Mm. Why is that so difficult? What is, why is the taboo so strong? It, it is hard, you're right. I think it was, it, was, it, um, was it Rilke who said, when I think of Hitler, I find I think of nothing. It's very odd. He's not, he, this is almost a definition of demonisation is that, that he is a, the space we fill. He's our boogeyman. We, we decide on what evil means, and whatever it is, we pile it into Hitler. And to, to me, that lets the human race off. Um, there was Daniel Goldhagen's book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, which came out, oddly enough, the same year as my book, um, uh, uh, Making History, which was basically trying to say, 
it's time for Germans not to load the entire blame of the Holocaust and the Second World War onto the existence of this man Hitler. And the point of my book, Making History, was let us suppose the sperm of a Lois Hitler, who was Hitler's father, had not hit the ovum of his mother. Let's suppose that moment hadn't happened. Another sperm had hit, or he'd been sterile, or they'd not gone to bed together that night. In other words, suppose Hitler had not been born. Can we be sure that the world will be better, the same, worse? Those are the three options, as it were, if you want to put them like that. And all my book positive was, it, it's a science fiction what if book it, it, in, in which someone is able not to go back in time but to send molecular matter back in time and by a coincidence uh, an un, a, a graduate who is working on a spermicidal pill or a spermicidal formula meets this physicist who happens to be Jewish um, and they decide what they'll do is they'll send this spermicidal solution into the water supply of Bruno in Austria, where Hitler's father lived, and they'll send it to a precise time so that all the water in the village will sterilize all the men so that Hitler obviously won't be born. And won't life be great? And you would imagine maybe it would be. Gosh, it's, I, as someone who's many of whose family, may, there'll be people in the room, many of whose family won't live because of Hitler, either through the Holocaust or through, through fighting, and fighting him in the war. And what an amazing idea. But let us just suppose, let us recognize some of the facts of anti Semitism and pan Germanism, Thulism, Tulism, as it was called, that there, there were in, in the 1890s alone, there were over a, a hundred regular anti Semitic publications in Vienna alone. There were more than that in Munich. There was an enormous movement, after, particularly after the First World War, towards a pan-German, uh, i.e. the incorporation of Austria, uh, anti-Semitic right-wing. Um, uh, Hitler was not alone. It was enormous energy. So let us suppose that it was someone smarter than Hitler. Because if Hitler made one mistake, uh, he made many, obviously, but if there was one that was crucial, it's the very thing we most hate him for is what saved us, his anti-Semitism. If he had not been so anti-Semitic, he wouldn't have passed the Nuremberg Laws. And if he hadn't passed the Nuremberg Laws, then the greatest physicists of the 20th century would not have exiled themselves from Germany, from Göttingen and other places, the Max Planck Institute and so on. Um, and you can absolutely guarantee that Germany would have had an atom bomb by 1940. All the science for it came from them, from Jewish German scientists. So let's suppose that instead of Hitler coming to power in the struggles of the German Workers' Party in Munich in the 1920s, it had been somebody else who probably hated Jews too. And let's suppose he said, well, let's keep them here because they, they, they don't like them, but my God, they've got some clever scientific things. He would have had an atom bomb by 1940. Ger America wouldn't. And who would have ruled the world? Not only that, instead of having to burn all those nasty Jews in ovens, he could have taken some of that Brunau water, that weird spermicidal water that appeared in Vienna mysteriously in the 1870s. And he could have given it to all the Jews and they would have died out as a race entirely because he would have sterilized them. That's, that is the premise of the book, at least, anyway. Now, it, it makes it sound like saying, oh, thank God we had Hitler. But can any of us presume to know, not that history is benign, but can we presume to know that a worse history might not have taken place? That's all. It's, anybody's welcome to question that. I'm not saying it as a fact. It's merely a, an inquiry a novel, a, 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 in novel form into, into that whole possibility. Isherwood. Isherwood. Isivu, as he was known. Is he our I? He's our I. Um, yes, they're, they're making a film, actually, about, aren't they? About, I think, uh, is it for television or for cinema? I can't remember about Auden and Isherwood. Auden was a great hero of mine. And Isherwood, to some extent, as well. Um, he wrote a book called Christopher and His Kind that was very uh, influential on me. Uh, it was an autobiography in which he treated himself as a third person, Christopher. He wrote about himself. Um, and as it happens, his most famous work, which is Goodbye to Berlin, probably, um, uh, was very instrumental in my being 
expelled from school, which started my whole downward spiral into prison. Because he, he, he wrote, Mr. Norris Changes Trains, I think there was one, uh, and then Goodbye to Berlin. And he, he wrote a short story involving this woman, Sally Bowles, who was a rather fan self fantasizing figure. Um, and that was turned into a play called I Am a Camera, which inspired the very famous one phrase review, Me No Liker, um, which, which is quite good. Um, but I Am a Camera was then turned by Candor and Ebb into a musical cabaret. And I, I was at school in 1970 something or other, uh, at the age of about 14 and 15, um, and I got permission from my housemaster to go to London for, the, for a meeting of the Sherlock Holmes Society, which I was a member of, and I was able to stay the night and then come back the next day. So, so I went to London, went to the Sherlock Holmes Society meeting, and the next day went to the first screening in a cinema of Cabaret. And I was so overcome by the experience, I thought it was so fabulous. I still think it's a great film that I stayed to watch the next screening in the way you could in those days. You just stayed in the cinema and they just showed it four times a day. You can probably still do it now. Um, and, and some rush of blood to my head, the next day I stayed and watched Clockwork Orange and Fritz the Cat and various other films. Uh, and it was about three days after that that I eventually woke up from my mad days and realized I ought to get to school. I, <laughs> by which time there was a lot of um, tapping of um, feet on the carpet and. Uh, uh, long sighs of disapproval, and uh, I think the time has come for the parting of the ways, Fry. Um, you have delighted us for long enough, and I was expelled. Uh, Jonathan Ive. Oh, Jonathan Ive. Hands up, who knows who Jonathan Ive is in this room? We've got, one We've got a few. He's probably the most influential, well, let's say the second most influential Englishman alive. Let's say the first most influential Englishman alive is Tim Berners-Lee. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, um, which is surely, I can't think of any, anybody else who could be more influential than the inventor of the World Wide Web. And when I say invented, he literally invented every aspect, not the internet, the World Wide Web, the WWW part. Incidentally, isn't it mad that people still say WWW as an abbreviation when it is three times more syllables than World Wide Web? World Wide Web, three syllables, <laughs> WWW, nine syllables. Anyway, um, I just thought I'd point that out. Um, so, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web and HTTP and HTML and all the things that drive the, the, the World Wide Web. And it was the World Wide Web, of course, that opened the internet into the p possibilities back in the early 90s that it has since obviously realized. But, Jonathan Ive is a rather wonderful story. He was a designer, young British designer, um, and in the early 1993, he joined Apple, the Apple Corporation. Um, the Apple Corporation at the time was run by a man called John Scully. There was, uh, it's, it's one of the great stories of the 20th century, uh, for at least certainly for a f fanatic of uh, digital things as me, but I think to any, anyone who's interested in you know, the, the influential events of our time was that in 1984, uh, the Apple Macintosh came out a few years earlier, in the, in the 70s, the Apple II had in, sort of invented the home computer, which had never existed, the micro. And, and the, the Steve Jobs, uh, who with Steve Wozniak founded Apple, uh, was convinced that instead of this command line with a fuzzy, you know, sort of neon-y green thing against black where you had to type everything in, what was known as a graphical user interface, with, known as WIMP, windows, icons, mouse, pointing device, you know, uh, menus pointing device. And, and it was this thrilling world, and it arrived in the form of the Mac in 1984. And then, over a difference of opinion uh, between Steve Jobs and the board of Apple, Steve Jobs was fired from Apple in 1985. And between 1985 and 1997, he had 12 years away from Apple. In that 12 years, he founded the next computer company, on which, incidentally, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. So Steve Jobs' influence there is colossal as well. And he also founded the Pixar Animation Studios, which, of course, invented really, in commercial terms, um, the, the possibilities of, of computer-generated uh, imagery uh, and, and animation. 
not invented. He's, he's, you know, a great salesman, Steve Jobs. He's a great, he sees the potential of things and he makes them ready for the market. But he's not innovated in the literal sense. He's not a, he's not a tech head. But anyway, while he's away, Apple goes, it's spinning around. It's in a terrible state. And in 93, John, Johnny Ive joins and um, is very frustrated. He's a very good designer. There's not much he can do because Apple is just getting, going from crisis to crisis. It brings out products that are very remarkable, like the Newton and so on, but nobody buys them. Nobody's interested. Everybody laughs. I was a passionate Apple advocate, but I was just used to people tutting and shaking their heads and saying, well, but, and certainly by 96, everyone was saying and were convinced Apple would no longer exist. It simply would not exist. There wasn't a market for it. It was something like 1% of all computers sold in the world were Apple Macs, and, and, and it just was not profitable. They had not made a profit on a line of computers for a long time. The inventory was piling up. The stock price was on the floor. There was no hope for it. Um, and it, it was so bad that um, everybody kind of, as I say, washed their hands of it and gave up. And they were so desperate at Apple, they actually invited it was kind of confusing. They wanted to buy Next because it had some software stuff that was very useful for them, some operating system software. So in buying Next, they brought back Steve Jobs and they had no one else to lead the company. He said, do you want to lead the company again? He said, well, I can't really because I'm, I'm the boss of Pixar uh, and you can't be the CEO of two companies. And they said, well, uh, well, we'll buy Pixar as well. Oh, no, I tell you what, sell Pixar. So he sold Pixar to Disney for a gigantic sum of money and Disney shares, Steve Jobs instantly became the biggest single shareholder in the Disney Corporation in that deal, bigger even than Roy Disney, Walt Disney's nephew, and he was able to go to Apple on a salary of a dollar a year plus a stock option. I'm coming to Jonathan Ive, I know this will bore you all because it's computers and we're in a literary festival, but it is so fascinating as a human drama. Um, he looked around this company that he had founded and it was in desperate trouble. Nobody could, would give it the time of day. And he saw this young British designer and saw some of his work. And he picked up the phone and said, come up to my office. And Johnny Ive, who'd had a desperate time with all his ideas being rejected and not really getting anywhere, had writ wrote out a letter of resignation and put it in the back pocket of his trousers and went up to the office, all prepared to be fired, and said, no, before you fire me, I'm resigning. And Steve Jobs said, I've had a look at some of the things you're doing. I think they're very exciting. Whatever you need, it's yours. Go away and come back with something exciting and new and different that will make people happy. And Johnny Ive designed this extraordinary one-piece machine called the iMac um, in transparent plastic, Bondi blue coloring. It was really remarkable. And it was the first computer that Apple made a profit on It had done for 12 years. And then he invented this, designed, it was not an invention, uh, but an MP3 player of such simplicity and beauty and pleasure to use that it utterly transformed the music market. And it was called the iPod. And then he designed a, t a phone. Here it is. Um, and then oh, it's backstage, a pad. <laughs> um, he, is, he had to wrestle it off it. Yeah. <laughs> He is so talented and so charming and so modest and so extraordinary. It is remarkable to me that he hasn't been knighted, uh, not because he would like a knighthood, but because it would recognize that designers are at the very heart of our culture and our, our society and our world. They alter the way we look at things and do things. He's as aware as you are and I am that not all technology is perfect. It doesn't mean that a thing is universally and unequivocally good. There are complexities and ambiguities about what the digital age is doing to us as a society, as a community, as individuals. But you could not be prouder of any Briton, I don't think, than Johnny Ive. He's worshipped in Europe and in America as the greatest industrial consumer, industrial designer of our age. But only a few hands went up when I said his name. And that's sad to me, because I think he's a great man. No, thank you. Knighthood. <laughs> uh, since you brought it up, what, why have you not been knighted, and oh, uh, would you approve of the system? I, oh Lord, I can, I'm. Uh, <laughs> um, if I if, if if I was married to a lady, I might have a lot of problems, mightn't I, with um, with them saying, "Oh, but I want to be Lady Fry." My wife might say, 
or I actually have a Twitter wife, Mrs. Stephen Fry, and Stephen she might want to be lady. Than I'd anticipated um, this conversation. It's not. It's it, it's terribly embarrassing even to think about such things. Uh, it would be embarrassing of me to reveal that I'd been offered it and turned it down, if that were true, because that would sound snipey and ungrateful. Uh, it would be uh, uh, embarrassing if I said, yes, I can't understand why I haven't been either. There is, there is however, a famous story uh, of a philosopher, um, quite well-known philosopher, who was asked by one of his students. He said, uh, there, there are statues of um, Nietzsche and Spinoza, uh, but there's no statue of you. Why is that? He said, you know, um, all my life I have believed it is better for someone to ask why there is no statue of you than why there is. <laughs> and... Uh, it's it, a lot better to, uh, for someone to say, why on earth did, haven't they knighted you, than to say, why did they knight you? <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy being Mr. Stephen Fry, thank you. But, but it's very charming that you might, you might ask us such a thing. Um, I, I knew Francis Bacon slightly, which was a great honor, the, the painter, and, and um, I, I stole a story he told me uh, in, in, in The Hippopotamus and gave it to, uh, uh, as an occurrence that happened to a character, but he, he was... Um, uh, I was born in Ireland, of course, but, but he had some, he had a knighthood, uh, but there was an honorary one, and like Bob Geldof, I can't quite remember. But he was there, and there was a sort of rather, he said, cliché sort of alderman from Bradford, uh, when they were sort of lining up and being instructed by Aquarius and Chamberlains and various things as to what they were to do. And he said, so um, what are you in for? And Francis said, well, I'm, um, they're giving me a, a, a knighthood. Oh, oh yeah, because <laughs> this fellow was getting an MBE or something. And he said, oh, yeah, um, uh, what's it for? He said, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a painter. Oh, you're not one of them modern artists, are you? To which France is not unnaturally. He said, no, I was born in 1428. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. Of course I'm a modern artist. What are you... <laughs> it's a just ridiculous question. Anyway, this, this very pompous figure. Um, so Francis went up, knelt, Queen did her bit and talked to him for a little while, uh, more than she usually did. Whether she'd been primed to, whether she was an admirer of his work, doesn't really matter. She did talk to him and he spoke back and finally got up and walked backwards and back to his seat while the, the band played, you know, a spoonful of sugar and those other sort of strange things that they play at these events. And uh, the, um, and the Bradford uh, MBE figure, he, he, got, he knelt down and he got his medal pinned to him and it just so, she didn't really say much, she just said it well done or something and it just by some awful awful, uh, embarrassing uh, bad luck um, he happened to let rip with a mighty fart at, at <laughs> exactly this moment and it was the moment the Queen steps back, which she done, and it made it look as if she had stepped back because he had <laughs> let one go, as it were so he walked backwards and then turned around, blushing furiously and then, to make his day worse, at the end of it, when the press gather round and everyone's in their shiny top hats and everything, all, obviously a huge crowd of press descended on Francis Bacon, and, and, and one member of the Bradford Inquirer, or whatever it might be, was, was sort of asking questions of this forlorn fellow. Um, and Francis, who didn't particularly like talking to the press, and said, oh, well, there was nothing very interesting, but that man was interesting. He, he virtually farted in the Queen's face. <laughs> And the press just chased it. He said, the last I saw of him, his hat was bouncing on the cobbles and he was running around the corner. I just thought it was the most wonderful story. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Lambeth Walk. Oh, my. There's a thing. Yes. Well, you're uh, uh, seeking to elicit, I must assume. Uh, I am seeking to elicit. <laughs> the story of, uh, in 1984-ish, um, my agent, who was a man called Richard Armitage, um, who had come to Cambridge when I was there with um, Hugh Laurie and Emma Thompson and Tony Slattery. We were on the footlights, and he sort of scooped us up in, in his uh, JCB, and, uh, and uh, we all became his clients. And he was a marvellous man. He had an old Italian tie and a Bentley and uh, cigars, very old-fashioned and very delightful. Um, one weekend, he invited me to his house in the country, which, is in, which was called Stebbing, um, and uh, in, in Essex, in that nice part of Essex, around about Dunmo, you know, it's a very much underrated part of an underrated county. And um, uh, he started talking to me about himself, which he never did. He was a very old-fashioned, sort of rather growly um, uh, Englishman. And uh, he talked about, he said, my father, um, my father was called Reginald Armitage. 
I said, hmm. And, and um, my grandparents made their money making pomfret cakes in South Yorkshire. So that's uh, like Pontefract, but yes, pronounced pomfret, right? Okay, pomfret <laughs> cakes. Um, and, uh, but my father, Reginald, was a very musically gifted. Uh, he went to Cambridge, and then he went to the Royal College of Music, um, and then he was appointed organist at St. Anne's Soho, right? And he heard a lot of modern music being played in his day, jazz music, um, and he turned out to have rather a facility for composing tunes. I said, well, gosh, that's interesting. He said, yes. Um, so, but he thought that it was rather embarrassing to the family name to use his own, so he invented a pseudonym under which he could compose, which was Noel Gay. I said, right. And so she said, that's a, I know it's an odd name now, but in the time, uh, it was very 30s, it's sunbursts and no games. Uh, and under that name, he was a very successful composer, and he wrote many songs, and The Sun Has Got His Hat On, Hey Little Hen, Let's Have a Tiddly at the Milk Bar, um, The Lambeth Walk, uh, Leaning on a Lamp Post, and, and so on. I said, gosh, that's a, that's a great litany of... 30s in songs. Yes, and many of these were written into a musical called Me and My Girl. I said, wow. Um, anyway, so gosh, it's getting late. I, I probably go to bed. He said, so here it is. And he pulled out this strange fool's cap. For those of you who are too young to know what fool's cap is, it was like what the standard paper size before the European A4 arrived, a little bit taller and thinner. I guess you could put it into a dunce's shape, which is why it was called that. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I don't know, why else would it be called Fool's Cap? I don't know. Um, so, um, he gave me this typescript. It was an old typescript, you know, where there were sort of orange rust marks where, where, you know, where the punch holes had, you know, gone. And so I, he said, I'd like you to read it. So it was the show, me and my girl. So I, I read it. He said, and, and the next morning he said, what did you think? I said, well, it's very interesting. It's about a cockney who becomes an earl. And... Uh, I said, I didn't really understand very much of it, because uh, <clears throat> what's this bus? Do they have a bus that <clears throat> on stage, or does it mean to kiss? Because he said, what, ah, what do you mean? I said, well, because almost every line was, oi, you can't say that, brackets, bus. I jolly well can, brackets, bus. I said, I, I don't know, what is it? He said, no, no, you idiot. He said, that's business. He said, there's a bit of business. I said, oh, well, what is the business? He said, well, it's lost, but there was business. And it was, either, uh, it was Lupino Lane, who was a great comedian, would play the part of Bill. And anyway, it was the most successful English musical in the 1930s that it had ever been. It was a huge hit. And he said, I want you to rewrite it for the modern age, it was in the 1980s. And I, I, I had never had anything to do with musicals. I didn't know anything about them. And to cut a, obviously, very long story short, I, I did this. Um, it was performed at the Theatre Royal Haymar, uh, the Theatre Royal Leicester, um, uh, Leicester, and then transferred to the West End, where it ran for, gosh, a uh, long time, 12, 13 years, I think, uh, and then to Broadway, where it also it ran for nine years on, on Broadway. Um, and I was like three years out of university when I started work on it, and, and it just it was extraordinary. I, 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 to this day, I don't know how I could have been so lucky, because if you do something on a music, because it was, it was also performed in... Mexico and Japan and Australia and Hungary and France and Germany. I mean, and every day there would be a flapping noise as another envelope hit the doormat, which was full of checks. And I was suddenly absurdly rich. I, I, there's no, I, I can't put it any other way. Um, my friends began to hate me and <laughs> in equal measure to borrow money from me. Um, and I, it was just the most bizarre thing that could happen to someone. And, uh, I mean, there's much one can say about it, except that um, I've, all, I've never dared do a musical since. I've been asked uh, many times by some very well-known names in the British musical if I would collaborate with them. But because I had such an extraordinary success with me and my girl, I, I, I just think, gosh, I dare do it again, basically. It was very fortunate. Well, thank you. Thank you.